Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. We honor creators and the creator's journey. And today we have a very interesting creator on, Carrie Holyoke. And he has taken upon himself the task of combing through Journal of Discourses and posting them on lots of, posting little snippets here and there on lots of different, we'll say, Facebook groups and pages that have a slant toward ex-Mormonism. About how many different pages do you post on? Uh, I see there's one, two, I think there's about five. Five different ones. I think I'm connected to about three or four of them because I get your notices that you've you've posted something. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to have to figure out later on after the show which ones I'm not members of and we'll see what happens. First, what we'll do is we'll get um, a little bit of background, maybe your five-minute Mormon story, your bona fides, and how you know your life progressed through Mormonism up until maybe graduating from college. We'll see what happens. So, uh, born in Logan, Utah. Dad was going to Utah State University, getting his degree in geology. Uh, ended up really growing up in New Orleans, Wichita, Kansas, some in Canada, Mission Field all my life. We would go visit uh, relatives in Utah. Uh, we'd go out there for a couple couple of weeks. But that was the only uh, connection I really had to Utah Mormons. You know, a bunch of my did relatives notice, who were, some were strong, some were pretty strong Jack Mormons. Did you notice the difference between the Mission Field Mormons and the Utah Mormons? Absolutely. Uh, the Mission Field Mormons, we were taught, I mean, I was taught from the time I was little that you're a Mormon, everybody watches you. You're different. So you've got to obey. You've got to be good. Because their eternal salvation depends on the way you behave. I, I felt like I had an angel hovering over my head all the time with a sledgehammer, just waiting to smack me if I did something wrong. So that was uh, that was life in the, the mission in the mission field. When I got ready to be a, a deacon, read the scriptures. So by the time I was about fourteen, I'd read Book of Mormon twice, cover to cover, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, uh, New Testament, Old Testament, um, Marvelous Work and the Wonder, Restored Church by Barrett. I read all of this stuff, and I had tons of questions. Like, where do Asians come from? You know, if we've got uh, this family that comes from the Ark, it says nothing about Asians. I mean, where do they come from? I mean, did they get cursed with, with some kind of a, you know, facial feature, colored skin like the Lamanites did? Where does this stuff happen? I never could get any answers. So it went that way. Went to college, went to Rick's College, back when Henry Iron was the, uh, the president. Went from there to a mission in South America. Served in Chile for two years. Growing up in the church was kind of cool, really. I mean, they had golden green balls. You had dances. Uh, there was church sports, there was basketball and volleyball and softball, big scout activities. There was lots of stuff going on all the time. They kind of sucked I remember the they, out they of had it a now. group. They had a group called M Men and Gleaners. Right. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Because I remember when I was in, I was probably like a deacon and a teacher. They still had the M Men and Gleaners. And they were kind of like the, the single adults who hadn't got married yet. So they hadn't uh, graduated from the program. So I remember, I remember some of them. Yeah. Some of them would have their activities like after hours on Wednesday nights. Did you notice a difference um, in your abilities as a freshman in college and then going on a mission and then your abilities as a college student after you're serving your mission? Were you a better student? Yeah. More yeah, I organized, I bet. More organized. I mean, I was getting up at, you know, 630 in the morning every morning. You know, my day was whole, all planned out for me. Right. And then I would just work until I was, uh, you know, just so tired you just go to bed. Of course, before doing that, I had a job at a green, I was a greenskeeper for a golf course. I got up at four o'clock in the morning, uh, rode my bike for about three miles to get to work, mowed greens, dug sand traps, did this stuff all day. So when I went to the MTC, other guys were complaining about how early it was. And I'm like, this is a vacation. This is great. Yeah, you been until 630. This is a piece of cake. Because of your job. Yeah. MTC was a piece of cake. And then college was a piece of cake compared to your mission. Exactly. So it just kept getting easier and easier. Yeah, I can't wait to, to get married. It. Then it's, then everything's going to be really easy. Well, you know, it took me a long time to get there. Oh, okay. I went to uh, uh, Mission, back to Rick's College. Had some interesting uh, experiences with, with professors and some of the uh, people with the honor code. I mean, I wasn't wasn't breaking it. I had some interesting run-ins with honor code people at Rick's. Went to Wichita State, got my degree in history. Went out to BYU for about uh, three years because my brothers were out there. Hung out with them. Great experience. Lots of fun. Took some classes, worked you a lot. Remember eating um, scones at the Rolling Stone? Or, Never did. Or Heaps Pizza, or anything like that, or the um, the Creamery. What creamery, was your favorite yeah. Go -to? 
creamy yeah bit brick oven yeah remember brick that oven, that's my man yeah yeah lots of skiing up at uh, uh deer valley sundance that was a lot of fun played lots of basketball we kept a team together for about three years by the, by the end of the third year we were beating everybody smith field house go and play mm -hmm. yep playing that rubber floor and then you you got to play on the the good floor you know with the top the good players players floor. that was right nice there. yeah but that was fun good memories there and it was there that i'd uh i'd learned a bit about the journal of discourses and i thought i should get a set of these things you only got three or four hundred bucks because what i was taught was the journal of discourses where the deep doctrine is your regular scriptures there's your basic doctrine that most people are kind of aware of and someday when you graduate from that you can go read the journal of discourses right cool. sunday school sunday school is the milk and the journal of discourses is the meat of the gospel right and so when i was out there i taught gospel doctrine we we're in home evening groups it was just kind of cool to have a group of kids who just do stuff together that was fun then went from there to law school out of washburn university in uh, topeka wow. got my law degree was a prosecutor for three years then went to the dark side for like the next 22 years and uh, defended people in the criminal courts did nasty divorces bankruptcies that kind of thing and did the you whole have time, somebody did there, was there a client you had that was like totally guilty that you either got off or you were glad that they went to prison? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there'd be times I would get somebody, we'd find that uh, a search had been done illegally. Uh, somebody mm -hmm. had just kind of, you know, beat a confession out of somebody and we'd get, the, get them off of it. And I remember several times telling the, telling the client, you know, you lucked out on this deal. You know, we got you out of this. So the choice is yours now. I mean, you can go back and do the same stupid thing again and you may or may not get off or you can make a few changes. Change your friends, change some of your habits, and you're going to have a pretty decent life. Well, it's almost like a mini Department of Correction. Yeah, kind of. I mean, that's because I've been a prosecutor before, too. Sure. So you knew both sides. Mm hmm Yeah. And the whole time so I you, was... So when did active. you get married? What part of your career did you get married? I'd been uh, practicing law for quite a while and married a girl that I dated when I was at, uh, out at law school. We were so together she wasn't a client that you set free no. from bad charges no. or anything like that? Nope. <laughs> No, we were, we were together for about four years, and then she got cancer and passed away. Oh, that's uh, sad. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. You know, stuff happens. Yeah. But I remember and every time something happened that didn't make sense, I would always have an excuse for why the church didn't work or have an excuse for why some of the leaders didn't work right. Because we, were, we weren't allowed to get sealed because she was already sealed to another guy, oh, okay. had a child with this other guy, and I got along great with her kid. By that time, he was like a teenager, and um, we'd always got along. But we weren't allowed to get sealed together because she was still sealed to this other guy and to her son. If she got unsealed, it would break his, uh, the connection she had with him. And I thought, well, that's stupid. We'll just, Why bother? And, I, and I'd always been taught that everything that doesn't, isn't sorted out here will be sorted out in the next life. That's hey, right. Cool. Don't that. worry. Don't worry about anything. It'll all get taken care of someday. Exactly. It always made me wonder like, well, then why are we saying do all the temple work and why yeah. do all this other stuff? And I remember from what? time to time, I would, I would have thoughts like, uh, okay, if we've got to do all this temple work in order for somebody to make it back and you have to know all this stuff in order to get through the, the endowment and the initiatory and everything else, then why is it that Joseph Smith saw Alvin Smith and he sees Alvin Smith at the top of the celestial kingdom and they ask him, how'd you get here? And then he's told everybody who would have accepted with all their hearts That's right. is good had to they, go. And we're thinking, why are we doing all this? Had they tarried long enough, yeah. On earth. So if you're if your heart is right, you make it anyway. So why do you no need that extra stuff? Don't even need the handshakes. Yeah. Because now when I first went, um, before going in the mission, we go to the Salt Lake Temple. And of course, I mean nobody knows anything. People know more now than they ever did. When I went, we didn't know anything. And so you go there, and I'm sitting there with my dad, waiting to meet with the member of the temple presidency who's gonna answer my questions. And they ask you, what questions do you have? And I'm thinking, well, I, I don't know anything about this. What kind of a question can I ask? And the question that hit me was, why are there locked lockers in the temple? Yes. I mean, why we're all supposed to pass a, a recommended interview. That's a good question. And why are they locked? Because we're supposed to be honest in all of our dealings with our fellow men. Why do we even need that? I mean, I can see how many numbers so you can remember it. But why do you have to lock them what, up? What I also thought was, why is there a cash register before we get in? Wasn't, didn't Jesus kick out the money changers from the temple? Well, yeah, these guys aren't changing money. They're just trading it for, you know, for clothes. 
Yeah, but then I heard that the money changers were just like selling doves and things for people to go yeah. do their temple worship 2,000 years ago. So who knows, Thank right? But, but okay, we'll, we'll put on a shelf. It'll all get worked out in the end right. anyway, no matter what your questions so it, are. Yeah, so I go through the not knowing anything. I went through the, the initiatory, and I, that was a that was a terrifying experience. I mean, you're, Were you you're totally naked. No, oh, you're buck naked. You're wearing this poncho thing that's open on the sides. This old man is in the back. Then they would touch you, so it wasn't just mm-hmm. a little bit of water up here. I was a temple worker for a year, so it's a little mm-hmm. bit of water here, a little bit of oil, and you're done. No, back then it was you know annoying, 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 pretty much everywhere. And I just right. remember closing my eyes, thinking, "Don't okay. touch my loins too long." Yeah, I'm just thinking, just be done with this. I'm gonna. I'll be the obedient servant. I'll be the good soldier. This crap will be over with soon. I'll move along. And that's how to deal with it. So I go and to the... In, uh, yeah, then in the endowment, what happens? Well, I go to the endowment. Of course, Satan scares the hell out of you. He tells you if you don't comply with everything, you're going to be under his power. And I think, well, I don't need that. I, I wasn't even under his power before coming here. Now I'm going to be under his power if I don't get this stuff right. So, and, you, and you went to the Salt Lake Temple, so it was yeah. a real guy. Yeah, real guy, live endowment, no movie. And so what I'm hearing is I'm not going to share this stuff with anybody, no matter what, no matter what. So I get up there. It'll, veil. Be, it'll be it for you. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you mimic dying three yeah. times. Yeah. Rather, rather than do so, I will suffer my life to be taken in a bunch of really hideous ways. And you don't know if you're supposed to take your own life or if somebody else is going to do that to you. Well, it sounds because I always thought that suffering your life to be taken sounds like it's a it's a third person passive kind of a thing. So you're going to allow it to happen, but it right. will happen. The avenging angel. Sure, I've got information, and I'm being I'm being sent up there to the um, to the veil with umpteen other people, and I get up there, and um, I'm with I'm with this guy. Dad's already gone through, and I'm sent to the veil, and I won't give them the information they want. I will not share it because it's says, too oh, you've sacred. Got to do this. You got, it says you got to do this, so just do what we told you. I said, uh, I made a promise. I don't know about you, but when I make a promise, I'm keeping the promise. So, no, not happening, buddy. And I'm thinking, maybe this is some kind of a test they got me going through. Don't know. Yeah. Everything else has been kind of kind of wishy-washy. They had to go get my dad, bring him back through, and tell me it's okay. Otherwise, I'd probably still be standing there. And you were 19. Yep. Just turned 19, probably? Yeah, I was, I was 19. I turned 20 in the uh, LTM. It was, the MT- okay. it was before they built the MTC. Right, and the so, language training mission. Yep. So first then you started, headed where? Well, first we went to the mission home for about a week, and um, some general authorities came and talked to us. Then we went from there down to the LTM. Uh, mm-hmm. The LTM, we stayed in Knight Magnum Hall on the BYU campus. And it, I think it had been some kind of a, a dormitory at one time. So I remember um, laying on top of the, the bunk bed and realizing he had a, a drop ceiling. So I touched my foot and realized, these things move. I wonder what's up there. So I moved one, got up there, and I could see empty beer bottles all the way around the edge of the whole room. I thought, really? BYU? You? I mean, hopefully it wasn't from the guys at the, at the LTM. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Did you count how many empty beer, beer bottles there were? Was it 100, 100 beer bottles on the wall? No, I didn't. But I just remember thinking, there's not a spot where there isn't one all the way around this edge. Crazy. That is crazy. Just tell like, how can that, all you know, these all these choice people going to the Lord's University <laughs> or going on the mission? How could that possibly be? Right. I remember thinking, how do you, how do, you do that? Because I mean, to me, it was a mortal sin to drink a Coke. It's like a Esau selling his soul for a mess of pottage or his inheritance. Right. right? There's no yep. way you're going to let a little beer or a sip of coffee stop you from doing the right thing right so go from there down to south america uh go to chile um when i left i was about uh almost six one about 165 pounds and when i came home i was six one about 130 pounds really sick intestinal infections uh i think i was out didn't didn't work for maybe a couple of days but i remember being so sick where you'd, you'd be walking along with my companion and i'd have to stop and just sit on the edge of the curb just to catch your breath and say okay Okay, let's go give it another shot. And you keep going. And I remember having the thought that, because we learned that, um, you know, the, the righteous elders in this life, when they leave this life, go directly to the spirit world, they continue to teach. They were in, I think it's in section 138. And I remember thinking, okay, if I drop dead out here as a missionary, then I'm, I'm okay. 
So it's not yeah. going to be, it's going to be all right. Straight to the top. And so um, as a, did, did the mission teach you something different than what you thought a missionary was going to be like? Well, I'd, I'd heard all the stories. My dad served a mission in uh, um, Oklahoma. His grandfather served a mission in the, the Southern States. So all I'd heard about was, you know, partly Pete Pratt's missionary experience, my dad's missionary experiences, that uh, you don't have that much success. You know, do the best you can. You're going to find some people that uh, will, will accept the truth. So that's what you're there to do. You're there to bring souls to Christ, help people come back to the celestial kingdom. And, it's, and if it's your job to get it done. If you're not prepared, if you're not uh, feeling the spirit. Obeying then, the commandments. Obeying the commandments, then their lack of success in the next life is on you. So I was just with it, just constantly. And how about, uh, did you dust anybody? No, I didn't. Did you know about it? Oh, yeah. I knew about the dusting of the feet because uh, I'd heard, see, down in Udall, Kansas, there, apparently there was a little town that was wiped out back in the early 1950s. The story we heard was that there were some missionaries in the Central States Mission who were turned away by a bunch of people, and they dusted their feet, and that's what caused the tornado. And I remember thinking, I don't know, I, maybe, uh, maybe not, but... That's an awful lot of authority to be given somebody to do something like that, to kill a bunch of people off. That's just uh, a little too much. But at least it was pretty cool if they're dusting their feet and then a tornado, which is a bunch of dust and cars and stuff going through the air. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different ball game. But I'd heard. About but you don't that want to take that responsibility anyway. You don't want to hurt anybody. No, no, I've because got to, I've got to bring next, them back. They may the next be set of missionaries might convert them. Right, because if you send them back and they're not they're not ready, then that's on me too. So like everything that wasn't going to go right was on me. Which is did you think uh, did you think at all it was kind of like black magic? A little bit, because I mean I would hear some of these stories. Our mission president would tell us some of these things. I remember thinking, wow, that's really impressive, but it's also kind of crazy. Like uh, a guy who was in uh, somewhere in the in the islands. But there was a big a storm that was coming. Everybody was told to, to leave the, the beach area and go up into the mountains to be safe. This guy wouldn't do it. He stayed and stays by his house. He's got his uh, one hand on the on the edge of the house, the other raised to the square, and then pronouncing by the power of the priesthood that his home be protected. His home's protected. Everybody else's home is wiped out. I remember hearing that thinking, that's a lot of authority, but I don't know. It just that seems a little bit odd. So why would James credulity? Yeah, so why would the Lord allow this guy to protect his home and wipe everybody else's homes out? Just because they didn't have another guy there with this arm up? It just seemed odd. Yeah. So you, you come home from your mission, and mm -hmm. you finish school, and then what happens? You, you become well, a I lawyer. Go, yeah. I go to Rick's College, uh, Wichita State. And that's where I did my little apologetic piece on... Uh, uh, the effect of anti-Mormon literature on the growth of the early church and learned about uh, rock and that translation and learned that it wasn't so. I uh, learned about Joseph Smith's uh, polygamy and learned that it wasn't so. Learned about the the different first uh, first vision occurrences and learned that, well, they're all the same thing, but you never really got the information. And I knew about the racial ban in the priesthood because I'd asked about that back when I was 14. And it just didn't seem right because Jesus taught that go into all the world, you know, teaching and baptizing every creature. He didn't say everybody but black people, everybody but Asians, everybody but, you know, certain classes. He said everybody, didn't leave anybody out. And now they're saying that if you're black, you couldn't go, couldn't go to the temple. You couldn't have the priesthood. But if you're, if you're African and black, you couldn't do it. But if you're Polynesian and black, you could. Right. And, or Fijian uh, or something like that, right? Really? How does that work? So that was, I'd learned a lot of those things and then fast forwarded to what happened later. Yeah. So you were in college when uh, the revelation on the priesthood came out. Right. I just come home. Let's see, it would have been 1978. So it would have been summer of 1978. I come home from work and my brother's up uh, painting, painting our house above our basketball goal. And he said, uh, oh, the black people get the priesthood. And I go, I remember driving in the driveway cool it's about time and that's how what a lot of we there are probably half the people in our ward 
were that great and the other half were you know i thought that uh, thought they weren't supposed to get it at all some are kind of losing it some are okay with it so it was different yeah i think that was like june 6th so you obviously would have been home from school right. working a summer job yeah i was getting ready to go out to out to school mm -hmm. doing construction work now that summer i had a friend who had been in some trouble with the law and he wanted to get he wanted to become an elder and we were we were decent friends and he he wanted me to go with him to kansas city which is like about a three hour three plus hour drive from wichita and he said he had to visit with somebody you know somebody from the quorum of the 12 to interview him to see if it was okay to do it and of course what i'm thinking is yeah i'll go with you i brought my sneakers i was going to go shoot hoops in the gym while he talked to this guy so we show up and now he wants me to go in with him and the, the apostle we're meeting with this Marky Peterson. Now I'd never, I mean, I'd, I'd met some apostles and guys like that kind of at a distance. And I think I'd met, um, oh, what's his name? The Grand Richards and a few of these other guys. They would just show up and, at your uh, state conferences, that kind of thing. But now I'm in this room with my friend and with Marky Peterson for like an hour. And I remember thinking, this is gonna be great. We're gonna meet with an apostle we're going to feel the presence of the of the spirit and the presence of right. the savior. Jesus it's might be in the room that. watching. Yeah. I mean there's there's going to be an open conduit to heaven because there's going to be all kinds of revelations showing up to let him know that my friend's okay to go, you know, become an elder. And I just remember thinking it seemed it was a big letdown because when he my friend sat down, Peterson asked, he says, "Well, says I see that you got in some trouble with the law." And I think he'd uh, he'd done some drugs, he'd uh, done some thefts and some other things. And he says, "What were you thinking?" And my friend, to his credit, said, "I wasn't thinking very much at all. You know, I was doing a lot of drugs. I was drinking. I was there was not a lot a whole lot of thinking going on there." Yeah, I don't even know uh, where, I, where I was at half the time. Yeah, <laughs> and so he says, "I just want to get. I just want to do the things that Straight are right. my life up." Yeah, and that's what he was there for. And Peterson was just. It was like having an interview with Oscar the Grouch. You know, it just. I thought this isn't very apostolic. I had better better feelings meeting with my bishop and meeting with their other local leaders than this guy. Of course, he's like in his 80s. It's hot. He's out in he's out in Kansas City dealing with this stuff. There's probably other places he'd rather be. But I remember thinking I, I thought it would be better. I thought it would be different, right. maybe more positive. But you put that on the shelf as well. Yep. Oh yeah. I I mean I by this time I had kind of a storage unit full of stuff. Yeah, storage unit. Yeah, I tell people like a forty thousand foot square foot warehouse <laughs> full of of questions and wonderments that we're all going to get solved once we passed away. Yeah, because my my dad's a geologist, very smart guy, and I remember asking him because I would I read through his uh, geology. He had a geology textbook he used in college, and I would read through that because it was fun to look at the different uh, you know Cenozoic and Mesozoic and Paleozoic and Protozoic and Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous periods, the different creatures that lived there. And I noticed in there that uh, from North America, there was a little creature called the Mesohippus. It was a horse that had apparently disappeared about 7,000 BC. And then I remember thinking, I thought there were horses in the Book of Mormon, but now this thing was gone way before those guys ever showed up. And where is all the, where's all the artifacts from the big battles of the Hill Cumorah? And I kept asking my dad, where did they go? And he's a geologist. So he's, he deals with all these things that show different types of creation at different periods of, of, of evolution all the way through the Earth's core. He says, oh, they just rotted and fell away. Really? Then how come in the National Geographic we see evidence of, you know, whether it's cave people or people in, in Asia or people in India or people in Egypt, thousands and thousands of years old. We find that stuff. How come we don't find anything here? And every month I would wait for the National Geographic to show up because I thought, this month, this month, we're going to see the stuff about the Hill Camorra. It was like Charlie Brown, you know, going into the, the pumpkin patch, waiting for the great pumpkin. This time it's going to happen. And you were part of the chosen generation that was going to usher, do all the things to usher Christ back. Absolutely. I think every generation has been the chosen generation. Yeah. Yeah, when I had kids and they told us that they were the children, chosen generation, we, we had a little bit of an argument. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 you, you got it wrong because we're the chosen generation. You're just yeah. chosen generation part two.
There was chosen generation envy, we'll just say. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So you you live your life. Did you, did you have any kids or anything? I've got two. I've got uh, uh, one just got her degree from uh, uh, university down in Florida in mechanical engineering. And she's pretty much out of the church. I mean, we talk about all the nutty stuff I find in general discourses all the time. Every time I talk to her, she says, well, what did you find out this week? And so I go through and have my little list to just kind of blow her away. So she knows stuff, but she still attends. Oh, no. She hasn't oh, attended okay. for a long time. Oh, She's okay. kind of like me. I, my name's still on the on the records. Yeah. But, me as uh, well. And, and it's it's not for any other reason than why not still be on the records? Yeah. Well, it's because I've got friends who, when they left the church, went to their bishop, turned in their recommends. And I remember when, when I realized I wasn't going back, uh, I thought, I'm not going to go turn it in. I paid for this thing. I've been paying for this thing my entire life. And if it's still good for another year or two, it's mine. I've, I've been paying a, a lot for this thing. Exactly. Sure. So that's one of your um, children. And congratulations yeah. on her success. And, and the other uh, served a full-time mission. She's now living. She's married, uh, living out in, uh, in Happy Valley with her husband. She does uh, advertising and marketing. They're both really, really good kids, smart kids, trying to do what's right. She's she's a little more nuanced. Her husband's still quite in. I think she's she's a lot more in than, than the other one. Okay. It, so so be- he's a true believing and she's a nuanced. Yeah. And they're they're making it they're making it work so far. Yeah. That's sort of like what my ha- wife had to work with for about five years. I was kind of nuanced. And then when there were um, some excommunications in 2014 and 2015, that's when I said, you know, I, I can't really f- go to a church that would just excommunicate people for having a thought and then expressing it. It yeah. seemed anti-American, if not anti-Christian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the whole time I would see things like that happen and I would just move along and say, you know what, if you got a leader who makes a bad choice, I can deal with that because everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's subject to the, um, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. So we can all have things cleaned up. So it's going to be okay. So even if a leader makes a stupid choice, I could, I, could, I could live with it. But at some point you realize, you know, things just aren't what they should be. Especially for me, it was doctrine. And then once I realized the doctrine had problems, now I realize, okay, the whole thing's got problems. Yeah, doctrine. So yeah, I didn't know about any real doctrinal problems, just questions until COVID summer hit. And actually watching Mormon stories with John DeLynn kept me going to church in 2013 really? and 14 because he would talk about, you know, if you have some problems, just let it slide. If the speaker says something you don't agree with, just doesn't matter. Sit next to your wife. It's a date, a free date. <laughs> you know, you get to hold hands you know, whatever. And uh, I I was at the time where we weren't dealing with any more bratty kids. And so it was easy just to sit there and just relax. And so that's what I did. Then I got a job where um, I could wear headphones and do it. And so I just listened to pop music mm-hmm. for five years, pop music. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and somehow in my feed, I started every now and then. I think I would listen to a Mormon stories interview, and it would be somebody's sad experience. And I think, you know, that's kind of sad that they had that experience. But probably Joseph Smith was a prophet, and probably Jesus is still the Christ. And I just am not sure about the apostles, right? I'm not yeah. sure they're leading the church the way they should. You know, Jesus started two churches, one ended after about 70 years in the Middle East, and another one ended after about 200 years or 170 years in, in the New World, in America. And so why would Joseph Smith do better than Jesus? And here we're coming up on the 200th anniversary of, you know, uh, the first vision, and maybe the church isn't what it thinks it is anymore. And that's, that's where I was at. So I, I wanted to be a modern Morton, modern Mormon Martin Luther and say, here's 100 things wrong with the church. My son would say, well, how many of these things have to be corrected? 
before you would go back to church. And I thought, well, if 30 of them were corrected, it wouldn't be enough. If 60 of them were corrected, that would probably be the right amount. If 100 of them were right on that they ever they needed to be fixed, I should be the prophet because I picked all those problems that needed to be worked on. So anyhow, and then the church wouldn't be true because I knew I wasn't at the time, you know, that that type of a person yet, you know. And so so anyhow, so yeah, so you're you're biding your time. You went through COVID. Were you attending during COVID or the, you know, well, no, the we, video meetings? Yeah, we had video meetings. Um, that's pretty much all we had. And then oh, yeah, we so have, we'd have like a video priesthood meeting and then you'd have your do your own sacrament at home, which was kind of cool. And then I'd just go mm -hmm. take a walk, go walk around the park. And that was nice. And I remember thinking, this is really kind of cool. I mean, just having and what this was the day. at home study book um, the program? Well, I, I've got one here someplace. Is it called Come Follow Me at the time? Yeah. Or something yeah, that else? was it. Okay. Yeah. And so, so I forgot that. to ask you what your callings had been for the last 20 years. Oh, uh, when I got, well, I guess in, as a missionary, I got as far as a zone leader, and then I was a branch president down there as a missionary, which is a little okay. scary. You have some 20 year old branch president. But then we had a branch that had like nobody in it. So, not a big deal. Um, came back. Uh, served in the uh, elders quorum presidency. I, 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 the best, the best calling I ever had was I coached uh, young men's basketball teams. I did that for probably about five years. That was a lot of fun. It was just, it was a fun job. You had to, did had you have like games. regional tournaments and stuff to go to? Yeah, yeah. We went. We would win. Uh, I guess after the first year we didn't win anything. Uh, the next year we um, won stake, and then went up to the. Um, Regional uh, went to the air once the regional tournament in Kansas City got smoked. Um, next year, won stake again, went up to the the regional, won one game, then got smoked. The next game, we the next year we had a really good team. We won stake, never called us to go to region or anything. Uh, huh. well, this sucks. I mean, we might have a chance to actually clean up up there, but uh, never got the call. They stopped the program going advancing. Actually, I think they still had the program. And I've got I mean, a, from, from advancing to uh, higher levels. Maybe the area authority yeah. 70s decided that they didn't want to do those things anymore or whatever well, it was. See, they, they, they had the tournament. They had the tournament. We just never got a call. Oh. Which was which Like was oversight? Wise. I don't know. So I just remember thinking, okay, I'm waiting to get the call, so we're going to go play in this thing. And then heard nothing, but they so had I suppose it. You know, discernment maybe God, doesn't know. work for sports. That's where you or, probably or, thought. Or, or maybe it does. You know, they, they don't want to deal with us, you know, with a much better team than oh. somebody else receives some inspiration so they don't have to deal with us. Right. So I don't know. Maybe maybe we would have been good. I don't know. We'll never find out. But one from there, uh, when I was in uh, when I was at law school, I uh, taught primary, I attended institute every morning. Probably not the smartest thing you do when you're going to law school, but uh, did that. Actually, baptized some people when I was up there. Um, then went out to Southeast Kansas to be a prosecutor, and ended up serving um, in the branch presidency. I was a clerk, uh, counselor, uh, again coaching kids sports again, and then we went down to uh, Independence, Kansas. I was uh, that's when I started my own practice. And I was still in the branch presidency, Bishop Briggs. So I've been a counselor in two branch presidencies. I've been a counselor two Bishop Briggs, Bishop once, taught seminary a couple times, uh, ward mission leader, branch mission leader, um, ran that um, addiction recovery program for probably a year and a half. So just had a so bunch year of things you, you did. How old were you when you were called Bishop? I was probably 51. Okay. So you were that. never on track to become a 70 or an apostle. Oh no. Uh -uh. No, I was, they probably, I probably got called to be Bishop because it was a small ward. They didn't have that many people in it. And I'd uh, been an incredibly faithful member forever. Uh, and then when I got married in the temple, then all of a sudden, then now I was probably probably Bishop. Of course I had a good law practice driving a Mercedes Benz. So I guess that probably looked okay. Yeah. 
people could look up to you and hope to get a Mercedes Benz someday if they are good enough. In yeah, the if you, yeah, if you want to, if you want to practice, and I would tell them if you want to practice law and go represent uh, people in criminal court, yeah, you can do that. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. And so, so you went through COVID, and 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 what happened to you after that to, that caused you to start to think more and more? Well, what happened during COVID? I remember getting on my phone and seeing a thing called Midnight Mormons, and I thought, oh, this might be good. It's uh, it's some some younger guys, kind of a Saturday Night Live thing, kind of a thing going. It's probably going to be witty, maybe kind of irreverent, maybe kind of fun. This should be all right. And they were just obnoxious. I thought, really? This is it? Just kind of just a personal attacks on people and digs and just try to see who could pretty much yell and talk the loudest over each other. And I thought, I don't like this. But I figured that's just probably personalities and different personalities are different. So once we got to uh, 2022, I remember uh, I, I sell cars now. I've been selling cars for a number of years. I moved to Kansas City, got our kids in better schools and um, ended up with a, a career change, which I thought was was pretty awful to begin with. But selling cars is kind of fun. Huh. And um, I remember coming home from on a Saturday. It would have been April Conference 2022. And I've got the TV on. I'm sitting in my bed watching um, the late General Conference. Of course, then I would go back and I would catch up the other ones before Sunday because I'd be at work on Saturday. And I'm watching the conference talks. And I remember uh, Russell Nelson gave a talk, and I couldn't remember what he talked about, but it reminded me of the talk he gave the previous uh, April about lazy learners and lax disciples. And of course, as a good member, I always thought, you know what? If things aren't working out, it's because I'm a, it's because I'm lazy. I haven't put out the effort. Maybe I'm not uh, feeling the spirit enough. So if it's not working, it's either a test from the Lord or it's my fault. That's got to be the, those are the only answers. And so I remembered. Uh, Back when I was teaching seminary, we watched a video with M. Russell Ballard on it, where he talked about the Gospel Topics Essays. And in his video, he said that there's a lot of um, you know, difficult questions in the Gospel. And for years, teachers have just said they just bear their testimonies and tell them everything's going to work out. But now we have answers for them. And so here I am, um, April 2022, and I'm thinking, hey, I don't have any big callings right now. That was like a got, worldwide, was that the worldwide fireside about church history or something? I don't remember. I just remember mm -hmm. hearing it. I was someplace mm -hmm. where they, they played it. Oh, thought, okay. you, know what? So you, you just I, heard the audio portion of it. I, I, yeah, I heard the audio and I was thinking, you know what? Maybe I have been lazy. I should probably read that and it'll probably take care of all these questions I've had. Piece of cake. The church produced them. It's yeah. your job as a member to consume it. Right. And so I get on there and I start to read them. And the one that uh, I first thought as I was on it, it, it talked about rock and that translation. I thought, no, that, that's wrong. Because in 1982, I learned that that wasn't right. Yeah, a prophet Cyril Revelator said it wasn't right. It never was done. But now they're saying it is. So I had to get out of it. Get out. I left the, the, uh, the church website. I thought, maybe I fell into something else. Maybe by my evil, right. evil ways and being lazy, I've landed on some anti-Mormon site. But I hadn't. Yeah. I was on on those on the, the church site. So I went back and I thought, oh, I'll read the rest of it. I read every one of them. Of course, when I read the scriptures, I would read not only the scripture, but I'd read all the footnotes that went with them until you ran oh. out of footnotes. And so now I'm reading the footnotes on this and I find out, wait a minute, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy and he married other guys' wives? You know, I was taught that never happened. They, he only got sealed to women after he was dead. That's what I was taught. And that's what we learned in our Sunday school lessons, in our priesthood lessons. I remember to, hearing the, the quote from Joseph Smith. I'm accused of having seven wives and I look around and only see one. Right. Yep. And so as I'm reading these things, I, I'll just keep going. And then he went to the racial priesthood ban. And said that was just, uh, it was a disavowed theory. You know, it was, there were things that just weren't taught correctly. And I knew that it had been taught as doctrine because I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And so I realized there's a problem there. And every time I looked at one of these, there was another problem. And I couldn't unsee or unread 
what I was seeing and reading. And that's that's what did so what do you me. do then? Do you still go to church for a little while? What 22, reading the gospel topics essays. Yeah. So what happens after you read the gospel topics essays to you? Do you do you go do you continue to go to church or you, you seek help from the bishop or a high council member mm -hmm. or the stake president? Is there anybody you can confide in? No. I just uh, I thought, well, what are these guys going to tell me? Because I know what they told because I, I knew what I had told people as a bishop. I thought, no, I don't, I don't see there's anything you guys can say that's going to make any difference. So at that Sorry. point, I started uh, reading, I started listening to some of the Mormon stories things. And one thing I wanted to check out, not because before I wouldn't even go on anything that was ex-Mormon or anti-Mormon, because that's, that's stuff of the devil. I mean, it's going to influence you badly. <coughs> and so then what I did, I thought, what are some other questions I have that they haven't, they didn't even answer in the Gospel Topics essays? And one was, whatever happened to Paul H. Dunn? Because see, when I came home from the mission, I remember Dan asked me, what would you like to do with your life? And I thought, oh, You like no. Paul H. Dunn? Yeah. So I listened to all the Paul H. Dunn videos, uh, the cassettes, reading the books. I thought, this guy's great. And I asked him, do general authorities get paid anything? He said, really, they don't. They get they make a little bit of money off, off the books. The church pays for their transportation. And if they're rich, then they have their own money. If they're not, to give them a little bit to get by. And I thought, you know That's what? Nice. I could I could deal with getting by. And I've got a lot of missionary stories. You know, maybe I could be a leader like that and help people out. And then he just disappeared. We weren't hearing from him in conference anymore or anything. And when Dan was telling me about Paul H. Dunn and I'm listening to all the videos, I learned he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. How cool is that? A major league baseball player who's a general authority. So That's as right. a what I do is uh, I go to the, the local public library and I check out the baseball encyclopedia because I want to see how good he was. I thought, well, he probably didn't play for very long because it would have been right before World War II. So I go look up Paul H. Dunn and guess what I find? Zero. Zero. I look up P. Dunn. I look up Paul Dunn. I look up P.H. Dunn. I look at any Dunn with that spelling. I look at Dunn's with, with different spellings. There's not one in there. Like D U N N E so I, or something. Oh yeah, I'm looking at D O N N E S. I'm looking for everything. I'm looking under Paul, you know, to see if there's anything in there. And I go home and I tell my dad, I said Paul H. Dunn played for the Cardinals, the St. Louis Cardinals, but he's not in the baseball encyclopedia. If he'd been in a game and he'd been a pinch runner, if he'd had one at bat, if he pitched to a pitched to anybody, if he was a defensive replacement, he would be in there. But he's not. Mm -hmm. This is this is just before the turn of the century, right? This or the mid nineteen nineties. This is nineteen seventy eight when I when I found that. Oh, and so that. Going, and so what happened? Oh, I see now? what you're saying. Yeah, you you were you were you you found that that bit of information about him was not the truth. Yeah, and so I asked. Being, okay, so how come? Remember asking my my dad and church leaders, how come he's not in there? They said, "Oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's not a matter of worrying about it. It's that." He said he was, and he's not. Well, you know, they probably don't have their information right. There's a baseball encyclopedia. I mean, they don't gain anything by by not listing somebody who's a member of the church, one way or the other. That's right. The devil went in and erased his name from every encyclopedia. Right. And so then I fast forward to 2022. I thought, okay, I want to learn about this. So I go on, and now for I find, uh, let's see, it was um, Lynn Packer who tracked it down and found out, and I'm reading this thinking, holy crap, I knew that in 1978 and just let everybody tell me, okay, it's not a big deal, when it was a big deal. And this Especially when we add it to everything that Lynn Packer uncovers. Right. All the stuff about the, the lies about the, the World War II stuff, the lies about the baseball. And then I thought, right, okay. So, so yeah, so what maybe people don't realize is that Paul H. Dunn was big, Big stuff in the 70s and 80s, hmm. and then all of a sudden he disappears from the face of the earth. Right. And so you're kind of wondering what happened. And so you, yeah. you find this Lynn Packer information, and what do you find out about what happened to? Um, well, I Paul found H. they made him. Found they made him an emeritus general authority. But I remember asking way back then, was he sick? Is he is he dying? Um, what's, why would you do that? Because he's not old. He's not like in his 80s or 90s. 
that's when you make them emeritus when they're so old they don't know what they're doing and so forward it went to 2022 and i'm and i'm and i'm watching these uh, mormon stories videos about uh, lynn packer i realized oh my gosh this guy was a church leader and he was lying about all this stuff and even worse none of the other prophets and revelators got it nobody got any inspiration nobody could see there was a problem and instead of warning anybody they just brush it under the carpet hope it goes away yeah and lynn packer's book was called lying for the lord right yeah i haven't read that yet but i want to yeah and i think um what people need to know is that polystone was basically retired from from any uh, official activities but he still kept on doing some things that Lynn yeah. Packer would also uncover about yeah, the real some estate sort of stuff. business dealings that went south or, or something mm -hmm. like that. And so it makes you wonder, do you think that Paul H. Dunn had his second anointing? I wouldn't be surprised. My guess is that uh, a lot of these, especially all these guys in the in the 70s and up, I know back in the, in the 1960s, some of the Quorum of the Twelve didn't have it. Right. But then uh, they started to pick it up. So my guess was everybody had it. And so, you know, according to the, the way it's spelled out in the Doctrine and Covenants, as long as you're not shedding innocent blood or denying the Holy Ghost, you can do whatever the hell you want. That's right. Which is kind of concerning. That's just right. So then after uh, watching the the Mormon story stuff on um, on Paul H. Dunn, I thought, I wonder what was going on at BYU because when I was out there, uh, early 1980s, I remember hearing kids talk about uh, shock treatments. I didn't know anybody who went through it, but I heard about it. And it's just some, I remember thinking, yeah, it's just kind of crazy stuff. I mean, who's going to do a shock treatment? Why would you do that? And so yeah, I just went some on. Loose, and, some loose, if it, if it happened at all, it was just some loose cannon in a basement right. somewhere. Doing, right. trying to. He couldn't really create Frankenstein, but might as well do these other tr things to see what electricity will do to people. Yeah. And so I started to watch some of the Mormon story stuff on that. And I realized, you know, those things I heard about, they were actually happening. And how awful it must have been for somebody who's who's been trying to, you know, live the gospel, obey every commandment, and they've got, you know, feelings and thoughts, and they're told you can't behave the way you are. So we're going to shock the gay out of you. We're just going to shock it out of you. We'll mission it out of you. We'll marry it out of you. We'll shock, we'll shock it out of you. And I'm not gay, but I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what a terrible way for somebody to try and do everything they, they needed to do. And they'd be disappointed constantly and be made to feel just so terrible. And I just remember watching those things and thinking, you know, all these things, I didn't see them and they were happening, but they were happening. And nobody who had authority was coming forward and saying, oops, we made a mistake. You know, we want to repent. We're going to fix this. They just they just sweep it away and hope nobody sees it. And then um, what's his name? Dallin Oaks, I think, was asked in Virginia mm -hmm. at a press conference. Right. Did did it happen while you were there? Yeah, not on my watch. Yeah. And then there's lots of proof that he signed. Um, he initialed, put his initials on meetings, which in which the things were discussed, or things yeah, had to be. Proved. And I guess what it all came back to me was, don't these guys ever have any revelations about anything? I mean, remember in the Book of Mormon, end of the Book of Mormon, you've got a prophet who solves a murder. He solves a murder by the spirit revealing to him who the murderer is, the questions to ask, how to catch this guy. And these guys, uh, and, and I, for the first time ever, I saw that picture of uh, Mark Hoffman with the First Presidency and Hinckley and Packer. And I lived out there when that happened, but I was busy, you know, working and doing other things. And all I heard was, okay, this guy tried to sell some fake documents. He got caught. He's gone away to prison. That's all, that's all I heard. I didn't see a picture that he was with these guys. Right. I mean, how would you not, you know, feel inspiration from the Holy Ghost to let you know there's a murder in your midst. This guy's selling you fake documents. And why wouldn't you get the, the seer stone out and take a look at that? Huh? If there was ever a time for discernment to work. <clears throat> yeah. And zero, just big zero. So every time I would look, 
I realized that, you know, I should have been paying attention. I should have noticed this stuff, but you don't. When you've got like one eye closed and you don't know any other way. You have your storage facility full of things on shelves. And now you, now there's sort of like, here's what happened. These yeah. were really problems. Mm -hmm. They really point to information that shows what? Shows there's no inspiration. There's no inspiration. There's maybe there's some good people. Because one thing I, one thing about the church is it's just chock full of good people. There's a lot mm -hmm. of good folks who try to do the right things for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. But the, it seems like and, the further up the food chain you get, the less and less discernment you've got going on. And it doesn't yeah. even matter whether you're doing the right thing or not. And you would think that um, as people progress in the gospel, things would get better and that discernment would get better. And it, and it just wasn't happening for you. I mean, you think there'd be some. I mean, as a remember as a bishop, um, we had a terrible thing happen in our ward where there was a um, a parent who took advantage of a um, a teenage girl. And so when I find out this is going on, then I contact the state president, and he says, "Go to your handbook." Of course, being a lawyer, I mean, I'm I'm used to going through all of the the handbook stuff, and you read all the intricate things in there. And so I knew there was a, a number I had to call. So first you got to say, call the state president. Then you call call the, the number. And I thought, oh, the hotline's going to help us. Great. So they'll, they'll give us some information on, you know, getting counseling either for this guy or for the victim or for the rest of the family. And what, what should be our next move? So I'm talking to this guy from Curtin McConkey, And I introduced myself and he says, no, you don't need to say who you are. So yeah, I do. I'm the bishop of this ward. This is my name. And I've been practicing law for, you know, probably 10 or 15 years at that point. So what do we do? He says, you can't do anything. Can't do anything. Because I knew that there might be a problem if I, if I came out and reported it and reported exactly what was talked about in the, the meeting that I had. As they could use that as fruit of the poisonous tree and say, okay, that information doesn't come into court. Anything that comes from that doesn't come in either. So I, I thought, okay. I've got to find a way to get around this. But he says, you can't even, you can't even do anything with the family at all. And he also wanted to know, what effect do you think this is going to have on the church? How well known is the perpetrator? How well known is the family? How well known is the victim? And I remember having a conversation with him like, what does it matter how well known they are? We've got a, a terrible thing that's happened to this kid. We, got to we have souls him. to repair. Yeah, we've got, we've got a family to try and put back together if we can. We've got uh, a victim to protect. We've got a perpetrator to punish and keep away. And you're telling me I can't do anything? Nothing. And that the church's um, name, the name of the church is the most important thing in this call. Exactly. And so, of course, what I did was, you know, thought about it, prayed about it, and then immediately got with uh, uh, the innocent parent and had showed them how to put together a restraining order to kick him out. Got him with a good lawyer. So they could get uh, proceedings started to do that and eventually got him to go ahead and confess to law enforcement and deal with the problem. So I remember think I remember for years. But that's like a whole thinking, wing. That's like a whole wing of your storage facility. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, did I do the right thing? Is the Lord going to be displeased with me because I, you know, tried to protect this kid? And try to protect this family and try to get this perpetrator away from him. You know, did I just kind of sell my soul out because I didn't comply with what church leaders told me? And I, I was bothered by that for a number of years. And then finally I thought, you know what? I just try to do the right thing. Would these guys like it or not? They ever find out about it, I'll probably be toast. And if they if they don't, that's fine too. Right. But you were thinking that was deal good with or bad. Yeah, good or bad, it was all going to be figured out in the end. It was already right. figured out in heaven. You yep. did your best. That's all you could expect of yourself. Right. Right. So anyway, let's let's get to how you started making these posts. What what made you think oh. that you would get go well, through glean information from the um, Journal of Discourses and start posting? About how long ago did that start? It would have been um, probably last spring, because um, I'd always wanted to get a copy of these things. Mm. And I thought, you know what? 
uh, I knew they had they had a copy they were selling at Deseret Book. And I really wasn't too keen on whatever Deseret Book would have. I thought, you know, I'll just go on eBay. So go on eBay and I, I of course, I, I researched, okay, what are going to be in the different types of volumes? Which ones are going to be exact copies of the originals and which might not be? So I get on eBay and I spend about 450 bucks and I get these things sent to me from somebody out in Utah. And I started just reading them. I sit down with a notebook and then just put over the left side of the page who is speaking, the date, uh, the page paragraph, the column, which volume it was at the top, the page number. And then I just write just in, in longhand what it was that was in there that caught my eye. You know, whether it was uh, word of wisdom or said that you can't drink coffee, you can't do coffee, tea, liquor, uh, hot chocolate or hot soups. And so I'm just I'm just writing these things out and I find something that's really interesting. I'll put a yellow line through it. And after I had about uh, 50 pages of this, I thought, you know what? I should share some of these things. This is so nutty. I mean, it's if for nothing else, it's going to be entertainment value. And maybe it would help somebody who's who's been kind of who's been leaving and they realize, you know, I, I can't go back. It's just kind of a nice reminder that, you know, there was a reason you left. And here's some reasons you may not even been aware of. In a way, it's confirmation that you're not crazy. You're right. not the crazy one because right. there is all this information out there that the church shielded from everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and here it is. And so so in a way, your posts like say, here is an interesting thing. And there's more. Yeah. And you're all not you have to nuts. Do pick up a book and you're not nuts. Right. Yeah. And so I, I've been, I guess since then, I've been posting one about every day because there's so much of this stuff. I mean, I've, I've got pages and pages of it. And I'll just throw it out, out there and I go, well, this looks kind of fun. So you could be 30 years old and post every day and never finish with the Journal of Discourses. Oh. Is that right? I'm, yeah, I'm halfway through and I've still got probably, if I wanted to post, I could probably be posting stuff for the next, you know, 10 years. I'm only halfway through the, the journal. I'm on uh, volume, what am I on now? Volume 14. And I haven't I haven't read anything the last couple of days. So I'll just come in and read something, find something interesting, post it. And I just figure what's something that would be kind of kind of fun to hear. Because I, I knew going into it that I was gonna that I was gonna find uh, um, blood atonement. I was gonna find a lot of stuff on polygamy. I was gonna find um, you know quite a bit on how much how much more uh, righteous Mormons are than everybody else. There was going to be a lot of that. And so as I would find things, especially there was one about uh, Hebrew symbol that uh, it's very close. To, I think it was a, a New York Times article that was, quote, that was quoted by some anti-Mormon folks years and years ago about um, him being upset that missionaries were coming back from Europe and picking out all of the cute girls and leaving the ugly ones for the church leaders. Yeah, but he I found a, a spot right? in the, Right. But um, that's been, there's some folks who think that's accurate, some who don't, because it's it's from a newspaper article, but I found a, uh, a post from the Journal of Discourses where he talks about the lambs, those who are gathering the lambs into the into the fold then they have to approach the church leaders first. So code language was used. Hebrew C. Kimball comes out specifically says, you all know what I'm talking about. You know, we're talking about you don't marry any women unless you get the okay from the church leaders. So that's, he, that's right. exactly what he was talking. I don't know why he thought they had to come down and actually explain it, but he actually does in there. There you go. So there've been a number of things like that that have been just kind of jumping out at me. You know, Adam God stuff. Has there been a post you made that that got lots and lots and lots of uh, reactions or lots of shares? You know, I, I don't even pay that much attention to that. Okay. I mean, there'll, there'll be some. I mean, there's some, especially the ones on um, on the women. There was one right after that. Uh, I think it was Annette Dennis who gave that amazing statement about how the, you know, the church gives more authority or something to women than any other organization she knows yeah, of. Just this spring. Yeah, and my first thought was she needs to get out a bit more. But I, I posted one that was, uh, I think it was Brigham Young. It may have been another guy, but I think it was one of them who said that, uh, you know, the church holds women in higher esteem than any other organization. I thought, really? Really? And there was one where he talked about specific rights given to the sisters. 
And as I started reading that, I thought, this is going to be good. And then I read through, and the specific rights were, you have the right to beautify your home and plant some nice shade trees around it. That's one right. And you have another right, which is to stop with, uh, with silly talk. Fabulous rights. I mean, you can take that to the bank. So yeah. there, there were a number of responses Truth. people had to stuff like this. <laughs> Just because it's so nutty. I'm thinking, really, a live person with a brain came out and said that in English so to other English I, speakers? I remember reading some discourses of Brigham Young, and, and I thought occasionally that he maybe had a sense of humor that was just a little dry or a little extra. But whenever you have a sense of humor that repeatedly um, mistreats people, it's not just that every now and then you're fun in somebody, it's you you pretty much have a bad attitude about some things. And so, so yeah, I, I predict that uh, the name Brigham Young University is not gonna last um, maybe another decade. I would hope not. I mean, yeah. you name a university after you know this this racist who hates women, who's extremely violent. Uh, it's just it's just hard to justify that they keep doing that. That's right. And, and I, so I anyway, figure, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say we could wrap it up here, and and we can you know thank you for coming on. We can chat some more in the future about some different things. Um, uh, maybe I can have you list if you can, whatever you can. Think of what communities you post these in, if you can. Oh, I can think of them now. Off. There's um, there's an Exmo, there's an Exmo 2.0, there's uh, there's a Kansas City Exmos, which okay, just us here. Um, Mormonism Live, Mormon Stories. I think that's that, all of them. There's about five Mormon of stories them. Stories podcast community, right? Yeah. Thanks for posting all those things. Thanks for um, sharing with our audience your story. There's a, there's a lot of information out there. And if you watch this show and think that all the information that you ever taught, thought was bad about the church was an anti-Mormon lie, there is information out there that might sway your opinion on that. You have to have an open mind, you know. Thanks a lot. Like and subscribe. And thanks, Carrie, for coming on our show. Oh, you're so welcome. Bye. And thanks, thanks for letting me visit with you. Yeah, it's been fun. I'm sure okay. this won't be the last time. All Bye -bye. right. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, so we did it.